God can do better than that. Won't you give God some praise for what you heard this evening? Have you been blessed thus far? Won't you give God some praise? If you will, just close your eyes for a second and imagine yourself at Calvary. And while you're in the midst of the confusion, while you're in the midst of the chaos, you hear Jesus cry out, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? You see, this, this statement often puzzles us. We don't really know what to do with this statement. You see, we look, is this, is this a moment of weakness for Jesus? Or is this Jesus showing a sign of weakness? How is it that Jesus can say that he feels forsaken? How is it that Jesus feels alone? How is it that Jesus is going through this? What does this mean about what Jesus is feeling at the time? And we dissect this particular statement and go so far into this statement that we start to notice things. We notice that this is the only time on the cross where Jesus addresses God as God and not Father. What does that mean? What does that say about the relationship at this moment? What is Jesus going through? And, and we focus so much on this particular statement that we miss a learning opportunity. I, I, I want to title this particular message, Lesson Learned. Wow. Lesson learned. Uh, uh, you see, I believe that at this moment in the crucifixion, we have two lessons that we can learn. Jesus is using the cross at this time as a platform for teaching. Let me explain what I'm talking about. Lesson number one, Jesus is teaching us how to use the word of God. You see, when Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus is quoting scripture. Now let's remember, Jesus is a Jewish rabbi. You see, Jesus knows the Old Testament thoroughly. Jesus has a thorough understanding of the Psalms. And he's quoting the 22nd Psalm where it begins with, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, the question is, why did he choose this particular Psalm to quote? You see, he chooses this particular psalm to quote simply because it speaks to his situation. You see, the 22nd psalm is where David prophesies the death of the Messiah. Jesus uses this psalm because it speaks to his situation. You see, sometimes you've got to use the word of God because it speaks to your situation. Sometimes you've got to use the word of God because it speaks to your circumstance. You can read the Bible from cover to cover if you want to and memorize every single scripture in the book. But if you can never find yourself in this text, if you can never find yourself in the word, then the word has done you no good. You see, Jesus is teaching us how to use the word of God, and this 22nd Psalm speaks to his current circumstances. If you look at the 22nd Psalm, everything that Jesus is going through at the moment is right there in the Psalm. You will see that it says that his enemies will surround him like dogs. You will see that the 22nd Psalm says that they will pierce his hands. You will see that the 22nd Psalm says that they will pierce his feet. Everything that Jesus is going through at this particular moment is right here in this 22nd Psalm. But you see, when you read the scripture, you can't just stop at one line. You can't just stop at what you want to hear. You see, you've got to read the Psalm all the way through. And if you read the Psalm all the way through, you'll see where Jesus' helps come from. You'll see where Jesus' help comes into play. You see, this 22nd Psalm reminds Jesus of why he's up there in the first place. You see, sometimes you need a reminder of why you're going through what you're going through. You see, if you keep reading in the 22nd Psalm, you'll see that David says, future generations will hear about the wonders of the Lord. You will see that the 22nd Psalm says, our children will serve him. You will see that the 22nd Psalm says, his righteous acts will be told to those not yet born. You see, Jesus is reminded of who he's doing this for at the moment. Jesus is reminded of why he's up on the cross in the first place. He's considering the future generations. Jesus at this moment is aware of the fact that he's the only one being afflicted, but somehow he's not the only one being affected. You see, Jesus is thinking of the future generations. Can I make it plain for somebody in here? Can I make it plain? Jesus at this moment on the cross is thinking 
thinking of you. Jesus at this moment on the cross is thinking of the future generations in the midst of his pain, in the midst of his struggle, in the midst of his trial. While they hang him on the cross, while he's bleeding on the cross, he decided to think of you. Somebody ought to give God some praise this evening because in his final thoughts, he decided to think of you. He would not come down from the cross, not because he could not do it, not because he didn't have the power to do it, not because he wasn't capable of doing it, but because he was too busy thinking of you. He was too busy. He was too busy thinking of you. Now, now I said there were, there were two lessons. There were two lessons to be learned in this particular scripture. You see, too often when we read this particular scripture, we, we read the whole thing and we hear, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But you see, we focus too much on the why hast thou forsaken me? If you will with me, won't you look at the my God, my God? Won't you look at the my God, my God? You see, you've got to focus on this word my. You gotta understand how this word my functions in a sentence. You see, the word my is a possessive word. The word my is a possessive word. So when you use the word my, you're saying you're associated with something. When you're using the word my, that means you're claiming something. You see, in the midst of being crucified, Jesus was able to claim the name of God. Jesus is just trying to teach somebody at this moment that in the midst of your struggle, you still gotta claim the name of God. In the midst of your pain, you still gotta claim the name of God. In the midst of everything you're going through, you still gotta claim the name of God. Do I have any name claimers in the building? Are there any name claimers in the building this evening that's gonna claim their name in the midst of the struggle? I'm gonna claim the name of God in the midst of my trial. Are there any name claimers in the building this evening? You see, a name claimer is a warrior. A name claimer is a fighter. You just can't claim his name at the mountaintop. You got to claim his name in the fire. Jesus didn't wait for the resurrection. He said that he's mine in the face of death. And he recalled the Psalm of David just to help him get through the test. But if you didn't listen closely, you probably thought that Jesus was weak. Well, my Savior was just reminding himself that he was up there dying for you and me. The crowd didn't have the power. The power was in the name he claimed. And what you thought was a moment of weakness. Jesus was just showing you how he deals with the pain. Jesus didn't worry about the crowd around him because he knew the Psalm was true. He claimed the name of God the Father out loud. But in his final thought, in his final thoughts, somebody ought to rejoice because in his final thoughts, he was thinking of you. 